and we're live we're live already that's probably the fastest time that hangout has connected hello welcome to anyone watching right now uh, we'll do a little bit of warm-up before we uh, step into this entirely um, because I imagine people are going to be filtering in as the links are being posted far and wide across various social media. But to introduce what this is, uh, this is a live Q&A uh, regarding the Contagion Chronicle, the big crossover game for the Chronicles of Darkness. It's currently on Kickstarter and currently doing very, very well. Uh, we have, I think, we're on the precipice of hitting another stretch goal, which is always lovely. But we have to say what is truly wonderful about this book so far is the sheer number of backers we've seen a, uh, a lot of change across the way people are backing our kickstarters and you know some of it's to do with the size of the book sometimes it's to do with things like postage and what we're seeing is a lot of people backing at pdf level print on demand level this time that's very interesting uh, but what we are going to be doing here in this video is answering your questions. Now, some questions regarding the Contagion Chronicle have already been posted on the... Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna ask my co-hosts to mute their microphones while I'm talking, um, just so my voice doesn't come out of their speakers or anything like that. And then when it actually comes time to answering live questions, I will uh, unmute them. So I have the power to do that, you see. I think we may have lost Clara, I was frozen anyway. So I will introduce my co-hosts, so I won't allow them to introduce themselves yet. We may be joined by other authors. Uh, I am joined by uh, Clara Herbal, who is one of the writers on this book. I am joined by Megan Fitzgerald, who is also a writer on this book. And I'm joined by Eddie Webb, who is also a writer on this book. And I developed this book, I wrote a little bit of it, but to be honest, I more oversaw their work than anything else and we can get into the what they wrote as we go on but first things first I told the people who tuned into the previous video on the subject matter that I would answer their questions so I will ask those questions and let's see if there's any good ones so Ventru Inc asks is the Contagion Chronicle going to address the power difference between the different game lines? How can we make sure the more powerful supernaturals aren't going to dominate the Chronicle and make the weakest supernaturals feel near useless? So I'm immediately going to pitch this to one of my co-hosts because Eddie and Megan both worked on uh, the system side of this game, uh, both the playable factions and the powers that they use. So let's go to Eddie first. Eddie, how would we... Oh, Clara's dropped off. Eddie, how would we deal with the power imbalance in the Contagion Chronicle? And I will un unmute you so that you can actually speak. Oh, you can you can unmute yourself, actually, it turns out. But... Yeah, I know, but you know, it's more fun than you do it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's interesting because uh, we kind of didn't deal with it to a certain extent. Um, a, a lot of um, how things are organized is that you, you people who are involved in these kind of crossover Contagion Chronicles um, uh, become part of these different uh, uh, factions. And when you join up with these factions, you do have access to distinct uh, uh, powers, which are calling vectors. Um, and different, uh, and there's kind of a core power that anyone who joins uh, the group can tap into, but then also specific subgroups have different different tweaks and twists on it. Um, so uh, uh, what really kind of came out, when we, at least I was uh, working on my side with the vectors, was um, trying to amplify what that particular uh, uh, creature type was actually really good at and making them even better at it. Um, so, you know, if vampires are going to generally have stuff that involves more like mind manipulation and, uh, you know, things that tax us to blood. Uh, werewolves are going to have more things like talking to and access accessing spirits and manipulating them. Uh, mages are going to have more access to things that help with their magic or to the understanding occult mysteries. Um, so by kind of encouraging character types to funnel into what they're good at and do even more of that, then it kind of helps to specialize things a little bit. So that way it's, it's less about an overall kind of 
uh, aggregate character level, for lack of a better term, rather more along lines of making sure that people are accentuating what's cool about those concepts at those moments instead of just raw numbers. Yeah, uh, and I think that was the best possible way we could have approached it. Rather than nerfing the most powerful creatures to bring them down to a level of hunters, you know, that hunters are in Chronicles of Darkness ultimately just mortals with a clue and, and a great deal of will in a lot of cases. And when you put that next to a mummy that has uh, only just woken up, the power disparity is massive. So we weren't just going to hamstring the mummies, rather it's about focusing on what each creature brings to the table and accentuating it. And I think we've managed to do that very well. It's probably one of the best pieces of feedback we've been consistently getting regarding the Contagion Chronicle. It's the, um, the fact that we're addressing powers by highlighting how fun they can be and how they can complement each other. That seems to have gone down rather well. So, next question up on the previous video on the subject. Um, hmm, Jared Lemon says, probably been asked, but I will be very curious to see how the game will address mixing splats with second edition content with those that have not been updated yet. Thank you for all the great games. I've already funded Contagion Chronicle. You funded Contagion Chronicle yourself, Jared. Well, that was very kind of you. Uh, I'm being flippant. Thank you very much for contributing. Uh, Megan, uh, can you go some way to answering that question? How have we approached games like Mummy and Deviant? Again, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. There you go. Uh, sure. Um, so we, uh, I know that um, Matthew was very conscientious of this when we started, and it, it's kind of the same um, process that we did on Dark Heroes 2 as well, where um, we had people writing on the book who were involved in the second edition, the ongoing current second editions of those games that aren't released yet, Mummy and Deviant, uh, Geist, etc. And so we've been in constant contact with the developers of all of those games, and we've had people um, who wrote on the systems of those games, including me. Uh, I wrote on the systems for Deviant. Um, I wrote the Splats for Mommy second edition. So we've had other folks that were involved in all of those games as well. Um, so we've, we've been in communication with everyone. We are gonna make sure that, um, you know, as, uh, as close as we possibly can, you know, Deviant's in, I think, second drafts now. Um, and we've, by the time we get to the point in Contagion where uh, the book's about to go out, all those mechanics and, and settings and splats and all that stuff should be more or less nailed down to where they're probably going to end up by the time the second editions come out. So we should be in alignment uh, as, as much as we possibly can. Yeah, that's certainly the hope uh, and, so, and our ambition. We're not just going into it blindly. Uh, there's going to be plenty of pit stops along the way where we can edit details if things um, don't seem to be lining up. And because I'm developing Mummy the Curse, and as, as Megan pointed out, we have uh, authors from Deviant on the book as well, we can hopefully keep everything updated in sync. Um, to avoid any potential problems. We have been joined by a random wandering John Burke, which is always lovely. Um, but before we get on to you, John, uh, I've got a question for Clara from Victor de Sena. Um, and Victor is asking, and this is something that uh, applies to the setting that you put in the book, Clara. Um, Will we see more various supernatural creatures connected to the contagion, like the Gerio is connected to werewolves? So what I'm thinking there is the way you introduce a slightly different vampire into your setting that you might want to talk about, and also what's personally your favorite version of the contagion in the book. So, Clara, would you like to talk about your unique vampire that appears in your setting and what your favorite version of contagion is in the book? Well, yeah, um, so my main antagonist in the Odense chapter is uh, actually a Viking king or an ancient Viking king. And he is, apparently he has been embraced in Edinburgh on a raid. And then he comes home and returns to Odense and he, he, he is the patient zero for this contagion. Um, and 
what I think is interesting about especially Knut is how he reappears through Danish history. Like you see him in the 16th century, you see him reoccurring in the 19th century, and you see how he affects the history of Denmark and the history of um, of Odense as a city and kind of forms the city around the contagion and the contagion forms the city. Um, so I think that is... He is one of the most interesting characters I've written, that's for sure. I um, I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but... Well, what about your favourite... Oh, well, you can by all means be egotistical here when they're saying, what's your favourite version of the Contagion in the book? How does Contagion manifest in your setting? Well... Well, I will be egotistical then, <laughs> um, because I think looking at contagion as a mental illness or looking at contagion as something that's not necessarily um, connected to to illness as the way we typically see illness with a germ uh, that makes you sick visually, um, this contagion is based on your mind and illness of the mind. Um, and that's the contagion Odense is, is a mental illness. It's a mental state um, that affects both mortals and vampires and, and everyone in, in different ways. Lovely. Thank you very much for going into that level of detail. And other questions we have from Alec Brownie here, and this is something I think Megan may be able to answer uh, and can be as ambiguous as she likes. The contagion being an infectious phenomenon that screws with natural laws sounds a lot like what various manifest manifestations of the abyss from mage do. Is there a connection? What do you think, Megan? Uh, so, <laughs> not to be vague, but the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, so the there are definitely, and I so I, I did the storytelling chapter uh, for Contagion as well as the Splats, and um, one of the things that Matthew asked me to do was to come up with a large list of just sort of story seeds, not large hooks like the settings are, you know, a whole chapter, but just kind of a paragraph of a seed of, of a story hook. Um, and so I focused those sort of several for each game line, um, kind of a focus on one or two game lines for each story hook as kind of a, a jumping off point. And so I think if I remember correctly, one of those um, deals with the abyss. And I, so yeah, when you think of the contagion as reality is broken or reality is sick and something is going wrong with the world itself, with, with you know, the laws of physics or the laws of magic or whatever, um, definitely it has some correlation with the abyss. It has some similarities, but that doesn't mean Yes, every every instance of the contagion is related to the abyss, and it doesn't mean that you need to use the abyss or mages at all in your contagion chronicle. But if you want to say, yeah, you know, it makes total sense that some anti symbol from the abyss infected the god machine and caused this particular strain of contagion. Absolutely, that makes tons of sense. Perfect. Okay. And I'm going to rapid fire through some of these questions now. Victor Desena also said, uh, will we see more from the sworn and false groups in the future? And do you guys want to expand on specializations? Yes and yes. We have already funded uh, one stretch goal. And we're, as I say, we're on the precipice of funding another one. By all means, check out the Contagion Chronicle Kickstarter while this video is running. All you have to do is type in Contagion Chronicle in Google. It will come up and you will probably push us over the edge. We will undoubtedly see more about the factions and some of them, some of the fallen factions. I'm sure there will be some that have uh, fallen into the mist of time, became infected beyond repair. Specializations were something we just kind of uh, tackled in a, I guess, a shallow end like way in, in the core book because we focus mostly on the vectors themselves and the edges, the vectors being powers that the sworn and the false use. Uh, specializations are where you really drill down into the highly specific types of creature that might use a vector in a certain way, like the Lancaire et Sanctum. So when you think of the various permutations of creatures to get to a Lancaire et Sanctum version of this vector, you are 
essentially pitching that to a one in 300, maybe more of every fan. And so we didn't want to put too much onus on them. Uh, but I imagine we will see more, definitely. Uh, Xander Critchley said, how much of the book is crunch versus how much is fluff? Two terms that I have uh, learned to loathe, but I'll accept them. Uh, so how much is rules, how much is setting? And uh, I would say it's actually fairly 50-50. While there's 12 different settings in the book, every single setting introduces a new mechanical twist, mostly in the form of conditions and tilts, because, frankly, I love conditions and tilts in Chronicles of Darkness. I think they're, they're a wonderful system, but also because you have the vectors as well, and you have the factions, which could be seen as uh, crunch or fluff. Uh, I'll answer a couple more. Kevin Greenlee says, so far all the previewed locations have featured the God Machine as a central player. While I like the God Machine for some stories, I appreciate it being something I can use or not, depending on the mood I'm going for. Uh, I completely agree. While we've used the God Machine fairly heavily in the Contagion Chronicle, there are some chapters where it appears far less than others. By no means is it an overt threat. If you're a faction comprising of a vampire, a mage, a wealth, and a Promethean, you're probably never going to even encounter anything that's referred to as a god machine or infrastructure. But it helps ground it in the, I guess, base setting of Chronicles of Darkness 2nd Edition that we've used the god machine as this prop. Um, in actual fact, a lot of the Contagion uh, story hooks can exist. They can stand on their own without the God Machine's presence. So you can remove that entirely, and they are still perfectly valid. So I'm going to throw this one to John, the newly arrived John Burke from Sumi. When it comes to the contagion itself, can you give us a hint as to the ways the contagion manifests? I'm curious about the psychological horror and body horror possibilities. As the author of the Edinburgh chapter, some of those uh, horror possibilities exist in in your city. So what can you tell the audience about that, John? Uh, so I suppose um, fundamentally it's, it's, it's about warping what's normal. So I mean... <laughs> We're dealing with supernatural monsters, so they're not necessarily normal as such. But what's normal for them becomes abnormal. Um, people that are used to perhaps seeing things a little bit differently, even from your kind of bog standard human being, suddenly go, well, wait a minute, this is something we're not used to. And I mean, that's even more terrifying for them, probably, because you've just gotten used to the fact that, oh, I can turn into a wolf now. That's nice, you know suddenly you're kind of like, oh, no, no here's this other thing with 16 arms and no head um, <laughs> coming at me. What on earth is that? Um, just when you think you've got a handle on it, it changes. In terms of Edinburgh, um, so I suppose fundamentally there's there's a mummy there um, who's appeared seemingly out of nowhere um, who can do things that the other mummies who are there sort of like, oh, why, can, why can he do that? What's going on? At roughly the same time, there's sort of spiritual possessions start happening around the city and the aftermath or rather the I suppose um yeah I suppose the aftermath's the right word of those possessions involves the people all getting very very sick um and vomiting up black horrific bile um and the vampires in the city also go well actually no this isn't this has been going on for a while this goes way way back so this is how everything kind of ties together and it comes back to uh, what Clara was talking about earlier and um, the raids of Knud coming over um, and all the way back to him this kind of sickness has been lingering um, to sort of touch on the god machine point before if you want to say um, oh yes it's the god machine's way of going oh, we're going to wipe this out with this sickness that's fine um, it could also just be that you know the, the physical reality and this is again addressing the point or the question from just now Physical reality, as we have it in the game, isn't supposed to encounter this stuff. It's like antimatter and matter colliding, and it doesn't necessarily <laughs> annihilate, but it mutates, it changes. It goes, ah, well, uh, how do these two things fit together? So reality changes to accommodate the new thing, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's kind of true across most of the settings, um, so far as I've read them. Um, definitely both of mine. Um, so... When the second one comes out, yeah, you'll see um, kind of more of that. But Edinburgh, I think, is definitely more in terms of the body horror um, 
that well, you you co-wrote the deviant setting for the book uh, as well yes that's mm. with with, uh, with chris allen and uh, we may get on with the with the ever wonderful chris allen yeah. uh, so i've got um, another question that i'm gonna throw to megan and i imagine megan's gonna get a fair amount of these because megan did write the playable splats for this uh, we call them splats playable templates i guess classes if you prefer um in the form of the sworn and the false and they are central to the contagion chronicle and this one's from victor de Sena, who wants to ask about uh, the ship of theseus uh he says seeing the ship of theseus modus operandi of benefiting from the contagion seems to be more of a false motive than sworn after all they don't seem that inclined into stopping the contagion what do you say makes them sworn rather than false given their ambiguous motives for the contagion um, the big difference between the sworn and the false isn't necessarily, so it, it kind of depends that, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the false are not really an organization among, you know, each one of them is a group, but they're not saying, yeah, we have, we're the false, right? They're, they're more saying, oh, well, those naive, uh, misguided people who think that they can, you know, heroes and save the world or whatever over there are calling themselves the sworn and they think we're the false yeah okay fine whatever. um but uh so the big difference really is usually it's either in attitude methods or a little bit of both um and while the ship of theseus does believe that the contagion is not necessarily a bad thing um if, if they think that it's sort of a natural evolution um or supernatural evolution uh, of the way that things should go, they don't want to see suffering happen, right? And they're willing to work together to mitigate all of the worst aspects of the contagion to make the, um, to get to that end point, right? They're not interested in using the contagion for their own benefit. They want to benefit the world and they want to work together um, to make that happen. And they'd like to end the suffering. Uh, whereas, you know, the Machiavelli Gambit doesn't really care if you're suffering as long as they're not. <laughs> so um, it's really a matter of attitude more than anything. Okay, and we will uh, whiz through a couple more of these so we can get on to the live questions. And thank you very much to those of you who are watching this live. There's, um, there's a few score of you, so get your questions ready. Uh, let's see, from what? Which one should we go for here? Now, this is an interesting question. Oh, it's a very long question. Um, I'm going to see whether Eddie has an inventive answer for it. I'm going to put you on the spot, Eddie. Aaron Grossman says, how does the contagion affect the other supernatural factions like vampire covenants, hunter conspiracies, etc.? Also, will there be a hybridization between the different splats and NPCs, depending if the infection is physical or met metaphysical? Like maybe the players run into an enemy that is an infected mass of Promethean and werewolf corpses, which I love the idea of, or maybe a beast that has gone through a mage-like awakening due to being exposed to the contagion, or is the infected splat directly related to the contagion to begin with? That's a lot to unpack there. Eddie. Uh, Over yeah. To wow. Um, so uh, uh, I don't think um, the, 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 the book as we designed it was really meant to go into the blurring of, of the lines of, you know, the, the so multi-classing, if you will. Um, each uh, uh, Chronicles of Darkness game line really has its own kind of distinct flavor and theme and, and dynamic, and we want to try to preserve those rather than muddy the waters. I mean, I, I think that there might be potentially a cool stretch goal or a small product down the line, but the core book, we want to make sure that each, there, there's a genre protection, if you will. Uh, vampires still recognize with vampires, werewolves still recognize with werewolves, so on and so forth. Um, so, I mean, I don't think we're going to be doing, we didn't do really much with that. Um, what was the first part of the question? I, I, I guess I wrapped up in the, the imagery that I lost the first part. The first part of the question was, um, how does the contagion affect the other supernatural factions like vampire covenants, hunter conspiracies? Oh, okay. So, so I guess, um, as far as your work was concerned on the vectors, um, 
uh, that, that does touch on it a little. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the idea, the, when we talked about this, uh, we definitely want to go with the idea that this is this is an overlapping concept. Um, you can be a, uh, a Ventru Invictus and also a member of the Sworn. Um, and this indeed, some of the a lot of these specializations are kind of that very specific thing. Like you know, I, I remember I wrote one that was like specifically for. Um, uh, uh, one of the hunter uh, conspiracies. One was very specific mm -hmm. to one of the the vampire covenants, and whatnot. Um, so, so the, the the idea of this is like you know your this is a bad example, but you know your day job, quote unquote, is what you play in those normal games as written. But then this contagion thing is a separate side thing that you're doing. Um, so how that and I think the part of the fun of that, as we discussed, was that. Um, the Chronicles of Darkness was never meant to be a setting where these characters get along comfortably. The fact that there is the contagion out there in all of its various forms means that um, there's that to be a really strong reason for these disparate supernaturals to actually work together. Uh, so ha when you are off spending time with other factions and then you come back to your core faction, there's going to be questions that you have to answer. And sometimes you can't always answer them in a satisfactory way. So there's a lot of role play potential in that fact that you have these overlapping responsibilities. You're opting into making things more complicated for yourself personally. Yes, you get some cool powers that come with it. And, and yes, you get cool access to friends that can do things that you can't normally get access to in your game. But that comes with commiserate complications, responsibilities, and so forth. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Eddie. And we'll go through some questions here very quickly. Neo Bull Reggie says, would it contain anything from Mummy Second Edition and Hurt Locker? It does contain content from Mummy Second Edition, does not contain any content from Hurt Locker yet. Um, to be honest, the books we have mainly stayed away from in Contagion Chronicle are the other blue books. Um, the Chronicles of Darkness games, and it's mainly been focusing on the core books from each game line. It uh, doesn't mean that further books in the Contagion Chronicle line, because as mentioned, we've already funded one stretch goal, uh, won't touch on books like Hurt Locker and similar, but the core book doesn't so much. There may be a few references here and there, but there's no focus. Thomas Mertens, I would answer your question, but it's related to Demon the Fallen rather than the Demon the Descent, and there is a distinction. However, if there was any <laughs> Chronicles of Darkness book where uh, material from Demon the Fallen might somehow seep into it, it would be the reality-breaking game of Contagion Chronicle, where worlds collide. Uh, Reaper Frost says, how much does the Contagion affect supernatural mechanic-wise? If I wanted to homebrew a disease, for example, let's uh, have a mage, sin eater, or wealth get infected with a Contagion, could I possibly make it so that in order to regain mana, plasm, or essence, they have to drink blood like a vampire or cause fear like a beast? Yes, you are completely on the money. This is exactly what the Contagion is supposed to do. The main theme of the Contagion Chronicle is change, and how change is terrifying to creatures that are so entrenched in ritual, tradition, covenants that have existed for centuries. And even when they are creatures that only live mortal lives, often the organizations to which they belong have potentially millennia of existence. So when their natural order gets thrown out of whack, uh, whether that is because a mage has to start drinking blood in order to recover his mana, which again is a fantastic idea, it's horrifying, but I love the idea of the world that you know has completely got screwed up. That is what the Contagion Chronicle is all about. Uh, Droxlet says, will the book have starter scenarios or do you guys plan on releasing a type of quick start book booklet PDF using Contagion Chronicles? We do have uh, an idea in mind for doing a Contagion Chronicle jump start. It's not in the core book, we'll have to see, uh, but it's definitely something that's on the table. Uh, Georgior asks, will the blight fangs be in spilled blood? Um, no, but good question. They're not in there. They are exclusive to the Contagion Chronicle. Uh, they may end up in a Requiem book in time. Can a Geist use their Bounds Vectors? Ooh, there's a question. And this is one of those um, myriad of possibilities that comes with games as vast as Chronicles of Darkness, can a geist use their bounds vectors? What do you think, Megan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if 
your table thinks that would be cool, go ahead. Um, no, I mean, I think that that's the kind of thing where, like Matthew was saying, we may down the line have stretch goals that uh, that address more very specific questions like this, where in the core book, I mean, even in the storytelling chapter, I think I wrote a paragraph that basically said, we do not have room in this core book to address every detail of every game line like that. Um, but that's the kind of thing that could be really interesting. And it's possible that, uh, you know, depending on your your group, um, the, uh, wow, I'm blanking on words right now, sorry. Um, depending on the, the combination of characters that you have in your group, whether it's, you know, that's the only uh, Sin Eater character that you have, or whether you have more, or, or is your um, chronicle featuring a lot of Geist antagonists and other kinds of Geist setting, or are you really having a Sin Eater joining a group that's more aligned towards some other game setting, something like that? Um, how how closely are you aligning with the Geist themes? All of those kinds of questions are the kinds of things that you as a storyteller um, would want to consider when considering whether or not, uh, you know, an answers to very specific questions like that. But I think, you know, if that's the kind of thing that you want to explore in your game, absolutely go ahead. Yeah, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, I guess we're often referring to X, Y, and Z or X, Y, and Z splats in Chronicles of Darkness where, for instance, and uh, this may be the wrong order, but if you're looking at something like Requiem, you often look at Covenant, Clan, sometimes even Bloodline, and there's your X, Y, Z. Well, the contagion element is your nth splat in a way it's the thing that you can even wrap on top and when you consider the sheer number of combinations that can fall within that nth splat uh, there's obviously an awful lot of ground we could explore with this game we need to be careful to not hyper focus on something that isn't going to appeal to the majority frankly because um, speaking pragmatically we need to make books that sell but it also needs to be interesting to the readers and the players and usable so something like can a geist use a bounds uh, vectors that's definitely the kind of thing i could imagine we would explore uh, you may get to the more what the wider fringes like can belial's brood do this power that the strix have, have access to that's probably a little more mm, fringe case that we might answer on a forum. Um, so, I should I jump in a little bit? Um, yeah, yeah. This is actually a place where the Storyteller's Vault can be really, really helpful, is if there are people who like do feel like they want to dig into some of the nitty gritty of how these things click together and they have a strong idea how to do that then if it's something we decide we're not going to approach we can theoretically open it up to story towers vault then people can make their own content to sell absolutely and i imagine people will start adding in fact people have already started talking about adding contagion chronicle material for specializations i saw someone posted um in fact a, a long-term fan of our products uh, nicholas milioni uh posted up his version of what hosts might how hosts might use some of the vectors from wealth of forsaken to hosts from so your aslu and your beshly which was interesting to see uh, and uh, and good work too uh david fuller says can the different strains of contagion mix to create new stranger manifestations i think that is something we have actually seen with the edinburgh odinsa connection because the uh, and shouldn't go into it in too much detail because Odinsa is the setting for the actual play that's taking place on this channel as well. Uh, but there's a connection between a lot of different settings, and you can kind of trace the path that some of the contagion has sometimes made its way around the world and how it's mutated from place to place. So, yes, contagion can mix, it can become something very odd. Um, the upcoming setting of Bend, Oregon is uh, particularly pronounced for that as well, where it's a contagion that started in an angel and is now being harnessed by a hunter or former hunter in that particular city or town. 
Uh, and so last couple of questions and then we will get on to the live ones. Thank you very much everyone for your patience or this doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to an hour. It all depends on how long myself and my co-hosts can stay up. Uh, Jason Italiano says, how are the disparate phenomena recognizable as the contagion to observers? How do the false, sworn on the false come to the conclusion that the blight fang of Edinburgh and the hollowed of Odense are both afflicted or infected with the same thing, the contagion? I would, uh, I'll turn this over to Clara first and then John because those that affect your settings obviously contagion doesn't always have to be visible tumors growing on someone's head but Clara how would characters in the setting you've written identify what they are seeing as something supernatural and unnatural You are muted. There you go. How they will identify what they see as supernatural? Yeah, with the way the contagion is manifesting in Odin. So, how would members of the Sworn and the False see the symptoms as supernatural and not just a mortal trend, I guess, a mundane trend? I think what's really prevalent in Odense is just the vast amount of people infected and how it just, it, it, it ruins the city in a way. It's ruining not only the supernatural inf infrastructure, but actually the infrastructure of the city is getting destroyed because no one is going out anymore. No one is communicating anymore. People are not motivated to live. And I think that kind of mass depression comes across as at least incredibly uncommon. It's it's not normal to have an entire city just to come from from a mental disorder or a um, a, a mental just everyone sharing this kind of mental state. So I think I think that just screams that there's something other than just a normal winter depression or a depression, just a normal depression. And also they will see the plantation effect, for example, vampires in Odense and see that vampires actually, vampires, they um, kind of see what they are. They see themselves as the monsters they they are, and that feeling of of knowing that you will live forever in this horrible, horrible state is overwhelming to a vampire that's affected by the contagion, and it will give them kind of a vampiric depression. It sounds a little odd, but it is just an overwhelming feeling of of nothingness of you are a, a monster you you do not provide anything good for this world and that also comes across in their vitae or the way they feed because they when they feed when a a a contagious vampire feed the feeding sessions can go terribly wrong it can manifest in different ways it can tastes incredibly foul it can leave you more hungry than you began with it can it can manifest in so many different ways and that again also shows that there's something here that doesn't make sense there's something more than just a depression yeah i would um i would add so i think one of the fun things about the odense setting is how insidious the contagion is in some of the settings, um, I know we've released New Zealand and San Francisco to uh, the backers at this point, and some of the content has been previewed to um, to the general public as well. The contagion there manifests in a more overt way, but when the illness is internal and in the head, just like in our real world, not everyone identifies that immediately as an illness. Not everyone identifies it as a disease, wrongly so, they it's a hidden condition until it's too late and it pushes a creature too far. And in Odin, so that's happening en masse. So what about you, John? In either of your chapters? Um, uh, I think 
in terms of the question, um, you've got to understand, I suppose, um, kind of what the word contagion means um, and what it means to the sworn and the false. Like, how do they know it's the contagion? Well, what is what is that? What is it that they're looking for? Um, you have to understand that it's not necessarily the same thing happening everywhere. It's not that there are this happens and that's the contagion. Um, it's something that manifests in any number of ways. So the first thing you have to overcome as a, an agent of the sworn, for example, would be, is this the contagion? Is it something else? And when you read, and one thing I really liked about the sworn chapter was that they all have their own idea of what it is and what you should do with that. So I think the answer would be different depending on who you spoke to. So even if you're talking about Edinburgh, for example, and saying like, well, how do they know what the contagion is? Well, um, <laughs> they all have their own idea of it. So like someone from the ship of Theseus might look at it and go, well, that's clearly the contagion and this is what we look at, but other um, members of this one might not look at that and might kind of go, well, that's not important. What's important is this bit over here. Um, so I think one of the, the bits I really enjoyed writing, actually, um, it's got a small part of the setting, which was um, the sort of attitude section, if you want, that's, that's quite prevalent in lots and lots of different books um, from Onyx Path. I've always really liked the sort of, what does this think of this sort of thing, you know? Um, so you've got you know all your sworn and false factions listed and what do they think and the way i've always tried to put it for them is well they, they look at it in a different way some of them don't even mention like the mummy they mention more of the blight fangs you know so like then other ones are going you phenomenon we have to deal with him somehow like this is a serious serious problem other people are kind of going yeah we, we could deal with him he, he seems to be quite friendly and maybe quite helpful and is he even contagious? Oh, we don't know. You know, and other ones are going, he's trying to take over the world, literally, you know, like we need to stop him. So, you know, they they all have their own their own idea. And that's I think you touched on it, like the insidious thing about it was that um you don't necessarily identify it, and it all depends on your personal kind of outlook. Um and one of the things I really liked again about the sworn in general was that um they tied in so much to the, the belief structure around the covenants and things like that, um, that some of them kind of go, well, this is actually a religious manifestation and others go, this is a scientific thing that needs to be studied and everything in between that, you know? So really, I mean, like most things, it's up to STs to kind of go, well, here's how you can figure it out, or maybe even a number of ways in which you can figure it out. And it might actually be an interesting point to throw red herrings at people and kind of say, well, I've included this other thing that's not actually contagion, it's just some little twist in a, a blood a vampire bloodline or this kind of new manifestation of a, a random power that I've homebrewed that yeah and they go oh, that's contagion no no it's just this guy can do something different it's just there it is that's a, a sort of a it's hunt. one of the fun ways yeah it's one of the fun ways you can actually use the contagion chronicle it doesn't have to be the main focus of a chronicle it can just be background it can be seeds there they are it's things that are happening that make your society weird you can play a vampire the requiem game just straight vampire the requiem and still have the contagion be present and essentially the, the prince is acting strangely you know what's going on there and the same vampire politicking and uh, and personal tragedy that exists in Requiem will still be taking place. But the reason the prince is acting strangely is because of this contagion that they may choose to investigate, they may choose not to, they may just think, well, the best thing for it is to put him down forever. But maybe if that prince has turned into ash, the contagion will spread. Maybe it's waiting for its host to be eliminated before it can infect other people. So the best thing is to put him in torpor. And so that's where you could have, again, the long Chaos Sanctum and the Ordo Dracul to use that religious scientific clash uh, will have different opinions. So you can layer the contagion in at any point in your Chronicles of Darkness game. So final question from the pre-recorded uh, list from Buffalo Bill. Uh, it's always wonderful to see you here, <laughs> Buffalo Bill. Uh, how is Hunter going to cooperate with the other game lines? Wouldn't they willingly, wouldn't them willingly aiding supernatural creatures, including those who harm others like vampires, and gaining supernatural powers through vectors be violations of the code? Um, Megan, what are your thoughts? How, how do we justify Hunters cooperating with other creatures? Sure. Uh, well, I actually wrote the code for second edition Hunter, so... Um... Uh, when I did, in the storytelling chapter, there's kind of a, um, 
the section that breaks down each game line's view of working with others. Uh, and so we did actually address this in the book. Um, and hunters, the thing about hunters is that no, there is the code, right? And the code is fairly universal, but it's also very basic. Um, and the idea behind the code is not, I can't work with a vampire ever. It's just that when it comes down to it and the choice becomes my vampire buddy or this human being, uh, the human being says the code is more important. Um, that doesn't mean you can't work with the vampire. It doesn't mean that, you know, you, you have to violate the code every time that you help out your vampire buddy. It just means that the code is going to say, look, humans are, humans are more important in the long run because that vampire could go eat somebody. And that's just the, it's, it's a, a fundamental twist of the hunter, of, of the human psyche that hunters have to go through to face this fucked up lifestyle that they've chosen, right? So that said, um, we know that many of the hunter conspiracies and, and um, compacts do work with other monsters. And some of the conspiracies only focus on one or two kinds of monsters, right? The, the Lucifuge is mostly uh, concerned with demons, whatever the word demon means to them. Um, and, you know, some of them are really only concerned with, uh, with sorcerers and they don't really focus too much on hunting vampires, right? Or the other way around. Um, and so the way that hunters would approach joining the sworn is to say, well, look, I don't have much of a choice here, right? I have to team up with this vampire and this werewolf and, you know, this undead soulless freak thing, Promethean, um, in order to save my town. And that sucks, and maybe I hate it, um, and maybe I will refuse, absolutely refuse, to work with that one vampire over there who, you know, I know they killed somebody, right? Or I will not work with fairies, ever. No. But I'll work with everyone else, right? So each hunter or each group of hunters, each cell or each even conspiracy, will have their own approach to how they reconcile working with the sworn and kind of going against their usual um, to get the job done. Okay. Well, with that said, we are on to live questions now. 50 minutes in, we get there. Uh, but, you know, we're here for a little while longer. So Clara is very kindly going to be um, picking the questions out of the selection and by all means submit all of your questions now clara will pick the best ones no pressure clara and be posing them to us and if it's uh, something that you feel should have an obvious one of us answering then by all means direct it to one of us otherwise i'll i'll choose who feels it so take it away clara what is the first question for the panel all right i'm gonna scroll way back here um I think the first question we got is from Bando1, and he asks if what kind of antivirus is the God Machine using in Edinburgh? So I guess that's for you, John. Uh, it's trying to kill everyone, to be blunt. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I think I think really what I, I put in was that like reference to all these plagues that have wiped out half the population of the city and this is actually a historical fact which i find quite interesting because i didn't know that. i used to live in edinburgh and didn't know that um and it's like it's it's attempted time and time again to cull if you want the population and the, the idea being to keep um these blight fangs to a minimum the 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 problem that that occurs is that that many people weren't supposed to be dying and all that death creates the mummy if you want that comes through and he's taking advantage of all that um so really, I suppose the antivirus is the, the the way in which the God machine, I suppose if you want to say that it's the God machine that's doing it, or the way that nature or reality or whoever you want to, to frame it, um, is trying to get rid of the blight fangs is by saying, if there's no people they can't eat, if they can't eat, then they're gone. Um, so it's just trying to go, right, and everyone you feed from and everyone you embrace will also become infected and their blood will burn up and they'll die. Um, the problem with that, as I say, yeah, becomes that... Um, all that death leads to an, an even bigger problem. Essentially, pointing out that the God Machine isn't necessarily 
<laughs> always doing the right thing. Um, but yeah, that's, I suppose, the answer to the question. Yeah, it's uh, very much curing a cold with bleach. You know, just just have this bath in in Clorox and <laughs> can't have cold if have no lungs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's up next, Clara? Um, we have another Honda question here, uh, and this is Charles Ugling, who would love to know how much the proper Honda there is in this game, and it's seconded by Banda One, who also wants to know. We kind of covered this a bit, but I don't know if we should go deeper into it. Uh, so well, every single oh my my voice is getting reverb. Um, every single setting has a uh, has a focus 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 game line from Chronicles of Darkness. Sometimes they focus on a couple. Uh, the Bend Oregon setting is the Hunt of the Vigil one. Just like the other games that haven't seen release yet, it is working with second edition mechanics. And the writer of that chapter david cartwright he uh, he he worked with me to make sure it was as up to date with second edition as possible and then the one of the developers of hunter the vigil second edition monica valentinelli has then had oversight of that chapter and been able to add her own input to it uh, so there's there's tiered play within that chapter as well it can work perfectly well as a hunter exclusive chapter or just like the rest of these settings you can use it across uh, well with the factions of sworn and false so it has support for hunter most definitely all right we have a question from preston bobo that says the kickstarter description says chronicle hooks to keep you playing for a year how deep do do those hooks really dig into meat of the meat of the story is there a plan for a more structured campaign well that's a good question actually because the one thing we're always reticent to do with chronicles of darkness and rightly so we don't we never want to establish a meta plot there's no one true way with chronicles of darkness never has been never will be and so without trying to provide a cop-out answer the chronicle hooks are as deep as you want to make them they can be the uh, the inspiration for a one shot they can be the inspiration for a chronicle that lasts a year or longer um part of the reason it says on the kickstarter that there's enough chronicle hooks to last a year of gameplay honestly there's enough chronicle hooks to last 10 years of gameplay and that's all credit to the authors uh Every, every single person in this uh, hangout and who wasn't able to attend, they all read the outline. They are all aware that in my books, Chronicle Hooks are what I like. Uh, and when I say my books, the books I develop, I am a very big proponent that every single paragraph, if not every single sentence, should have something that's playable in the game or usable in a game. And I know I harp on about it, but I think it's important. And the Chronicles of Darkness, and specifically the Contagion Chronicle, is incredibly strong for that. Every single chapter has an entire subsection of Chronicle Hooks and of Rumours. And that means you can use as many or as few as you like. And uh, every single setting has a deeper level of plot that goes into in the what was this setting what is it now what is the symptom what is the cure you can just pursue that main plot a bit like let's say you were playing oblivion uh, elder scrolls oblivion you could go straight through the first gate you find and start hitting daedric over the head when you're only first level or you can bop around talking to the nosferatu that works in the graveyard that has had to chase people off recently and might know a little bit about contagion you know do all your subplots around the city but ultimately you can go straight back onto the main line instead if you like so what's up next Clara we have Keegan Sullivan who asks will we see art slash terrible for the players alliances between the antagonists between various Chronicles of Darkness lines okay um, hello Keegan by the way uh, we've had the Grand Masquerade have been friends ever since and uh, oh I think Eddie this would be a good question for you because some of the antagonists have appeared in the vectors and mm -hmm. if Megamos wants to add on top of that, um, how would you see some of those antagonists working together in a game like this? Um, I, I think really, uh, Megan kind of touched on this, but um, it, it's 
the line between protagonists and antagonists is is really blurry, uh, and I think it's rightfully so. Um, we, we've kind of structured it so the playable uh, arc archetypes templates are kind of on one side of the divide and, and the, the antagonists are kind of on the other side of the divide. Um, but Megan very cleverly wrote the uh, uh, false vectors or the false uh, factions as theoretically playable. Um, and so we built those the same way. So um, uh, uh, I think that there's lots of different configurations. Um, uh, one thing I'm excited by, I will say, is um, – uh, there was a, a short story, um, and I, I, I wish I remember where, which anthology you published it in, uh, but it was uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, some mages possessing people were meeting with some vampires that were also possessing people, uh, and, and they were kind of trying to, to argue their way through kind of a territory dispute, as it were. Um, and it's the idea that these two groups have something in common, the fact that, you know, uh, they – possess other people to to manipulate and do things um, gives them an ideological touchdown that they can work from. And I think that there are other antagonists that can do something similar, where it's like if, if one of the uh, false vectors actually is sympathetic towards a group of different antagonists with game lines, they could, again, they have that kind of umbrella faction uh, concept in the same way that the player characters have. And also I think it interestingly muddies the lines because then it's the, okay, well, how do we know that what we're doing is that far off from what this other group is doing. And now um, one of you may be able to correct me, one of the viewers may be able to, I think that was in Horror Recognition Guide. Don't know if it was- Yes, that does sound right. Yeah. Sound right. Um, what about you, Megan? Because of course you wrote the factions for the game uh, in terms of incorporating creatures like the Pure, the Strix and uh, Seers into uh, Contagion Chronicle. Where would they stand on all of this? Sure. Um... <clears throat> And I think I was talking to somebody on the forums about this uh, too, maybe a week or two ago. Um, that it, uh, like a lot of things in this book, it really depends. But um, uh, like Eddie was saying, you know, some of the uh, some of the false groups um, lend themselves better toward one or the other. I think, if I remember correctly, uh, one of them was actually found. The uh, Crucible Initiative was founded by one of the pure and um, and, and a God Machine Angel, and um, you know, the Crucible Initiative wants to get rid of the Contagion. They just don't care what else they get rid of in the meantime, and they don't really care to work with any of the Sworn to do that. Um, but since the Pure are people, and they all have their own opinions on how things work, you know, um, it's definitely not inconceivable that one of the Pure could say, well, you know, I don't like these Forsaken guys, but... Uh, in the interests of preserving lives or my pack or my town or whatever, um, I'm going to join up with, say, the uh, cryptocracy. And, you know, I don't like these people. And once this whole thing is over, I'm going to go back to antagonizing them constantly. But I can work with them for five minutes. Um, and on the other hand, you know, you have things like the Strix, where I think there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with that. Um, a Strix could be possessing a vampire and that vampire could join your sworn group. Uh, and maybe the other vampires in your sworn group are really upset, but what are you going to do? It's that or, you know, try to kill each other while the world is falling apart around you. Um, and I think that the idea of, of taking the antagonists from these various game lines and looping them in to work potentially with the PCs uh, or with the sworn um, or even having uh, player characters join a false group um, is a really rich area of potential uh, story hooks for crossover. And that kind of, you know, can I work with this person? Is it okay for me, my personal morality or my personal ethics to work with this seer of the throne that I hate? Well, that's a question for you to answer as your story goes along, you know, and I think that's a really interesting place where the, um, the Contagion story hooks really are a good way to explore that. The uh, actual play of Contagion Chronicle that's on this channel, the next part of which will be uploaded tomorrow. Uh, actually, one of the protagonists is an ivory claw, uh, using some of the uh, mechanics from the upcoming Shunned by the Moon. So if you're interested in that, do check out. There's an Ivory Claw, a, a Beast, a Promethean, and a Changeling. So it's by no means a normal group. But again, 
when outside threats come down. Uh, the strongest comparison I've found, and to be honest, Rose Bailey, who I initially spoke to this, I spoke to about this idea, um, and I discussed this a little. It's the DC style crisis where you have an anti-monitor like Galactic or Galactus style threat that if you want to go Marvel and so, you know you will get your Flash rogues, you will get your Lex Luthor and they for just a few nights will team up with the Flash and with Superman to offset the greater threat but there will always be that Brainiac there will always be that Joker who will just want to see the world burn no matter who is fighting. No matter what the stakes are, they will try and get one up on everyone else. Uh, unfortunately, as a as a father now, I'm starting to see more comparisons to Thomas the Tank Engine Christmas special, where uh, the good engines must align with the evil diesel to shunt the trucks to the end of the line because of the snow. Anyway... <laughs> But that's how I think it's Now, uh, it's when Diesel and Duck have to align with Thomas and Gordon despite their mutual differences. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of talk for me. I think we should get back to vampires and werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a question from Karl Hoftoniska. And he's asked, beyond vectors themselves, are there going to be more things to spend Swan experience on, like faction modes and such? Not in the core yeah. book, though it's a wonderful idea. It's certainly something we've been considering. And again, this is exactly the kind of material I would love to see in stretch goal uh, books. Um, the primary focus uh, for the Contagion Chronicle core is essentially the reason these creatures get together. And you can either do it for the altruistic perspective that together they will save the world. But let's be honest, these are Frankensteins. They're arisen. They're sin eaters. They aren't necessarily pure of heart. The vectors provide that mercenary appeal. By allying with the... Um, autumn courtier down the road who you may not see eye to eye with yes you manage to hold the contagion at bay but you also get access to power untold that you never had access to before just by essentially sharing a bond a sworn bond with this changeling and once the contagion is diminished you never have to speak to again but if the contagion ever returns you know that you will probably be knocking on that that's uh, changeling's door and saying well, looks like we are standing side by side again, my friend, and then you'll be able to use your powers together. So right now, that's the focus. But having other things to spend sworn experiences on is certainly not um, off the cards. Okay. We have a question from Dogger Days Radio. And... It says, is it possible we can get either some fiction or hooks that relate back to the old three shades of night story from Chronicles of Dr. Chicago? Some of those characters would be a great way to explore the contagion. Oh, that's a missed, a missed opportunity. <laughs> uh, sadly, that hasn't been done with Contagion Chronicles. If only I had consulted you beforehand, Chris, if that's Chris behind the profile. It is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, keep your keep your eye on this ball because I may have to make some changes before release. <laughs> <laughs> Consider Another that idea question? stolen. Another question from Target is Radio or Chris. Is there any insight via the Contagion Chronicle to the life of a Promethean that has become human and then becomes something else? Mage, vampire, senior, etc. Sorry, so could you repeat that question? I'm not sure I understand it. Is there any insight via the Contagion Chronicle to the life of a Promethean that has become human and then becomes something else? Mage, vampire, senior, etc. Hmm, 
I don't think we have anything in the book that is directly connected to that. But again, um, uh, sorry to keep putting you on the spot, Megan, but I know you you have a good mind for Promethean among many other games. Um, how could you see the contagion interfering with a Promethean's pilgrimage and maybe even turning it into something completely different, a different supernatural template? Do you think that's possible? Um. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. I think um, I think I see where the question is coming from as as uh, taking a Promethean, completing the New Dawn, and then you know getting embraced or something like that is definitely something that could easily lend itself to crossover. Um, so I think there's definitely room for the Contagion to do something strange in there. Say you're a Promethean and you achieve New Dawn, but you are infected with the Contagion before that happens. And so, um, I mean, this is just me, like, I don't know, coming up with things off the top of my head. And then you become human and everything's great, but uh, parts of your Promethean life linger because you're infected and then you get embraced by a vampire and suddenly your contagion as a Promethean spreads to vampires and does something really weird. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely room for that kind of uh, for that kind of thing. I think, again, as we've been saying, the core book, um, you know, is really just setting the stage. And there's tons and tons of space for exploring this kind of thing down the line. Okay, and what's the next question? We have a question from Dutim103. Will Deviant play a significant role in Contagion? I am very much intrigued by this splat. Can any of you give us a morsel of insider information on them? Uh, all of the splats have a roughly balanced amount of content in the book, uh, but John, can you give any morsels of information to cast your mind back to your work on the Santiago chapter? Uh, can you give any morsel of information regarding that setting and how deviants play into it? You can be as tight-lipped as you like. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't open the doors for me. Um, I suppose what I would say, um, without wanting to reveal too much, is that if you consider what a deviant is, um, so a person that's been augmented in some way, mutated, some would say, changed, but are still fundamentally human to some extent, um, something like the contagion for those that are interested in either becoming or creating deviants would be very interested in something which changes people and mutates them and creates new powers, new abilities, things like that. And that is very much at the heart um, of what Chris and I wrote for Santiago, um, is essentially that, like, here's this thing, it seems to be affecting people somehow, and there's always going to be someone that goes, oh, we could use this to create our own private army of super soldiers or whatever you want, you know, um, to have it. And that is where Deviant for me comes in. Also in the fiction I wrote for Edinburgh has a Deviant um, who sees herself as sort of the only one that really cares about humanity because she's the only one that still is, you know, um, working her ass off to basically defeat the contagion. So um, they can essentially appear anywhere. But I think... Um, certainly as far as I read it, and this was my first um, encounter with Deviant as a thing, um, and I thought, well, th this is just the perfect foil for Contagion, just in, st in how it plays into their fundamental reason for being. So, yeah, I think not just in what's been written for, for the Chile setting, which I really enjoyed, it's one of the best things I've written, in my opinion, um, but it could also just have the same sort of play anywhere, just through their very nature. Yeah, it's worth noting, uh, in case anyone's missed it, there is at least one setting for every continent in this book. Uh, we were very keen to provide a bit of global coverage, and while the majority, uh, well, the continent with the biggest amount of coverage is Europe, what can I say, I'm biased. Uh, some of us love Europe still. Um, the... <laughs> The remainder of the book by no means uh, isolates any of the continents. You have everything, including a setting in Antarctica. And I think that's an important thing to note in case anyone was unaware. Not only is there a setting in every single continent, there is also a setting for every single game line. So if you're a fan, even if it's just to read these books from whether it's Vampire, Werewolf, Mage, Promethean, Changeling, Hunter, Geist, Mummy, Beast, Demon, deviant 
Have I missed any? Uh, you will find something in this book that appeals to you. So, Clara, any other questions? Yes. Um, this is Lord Sidious asking, I've seen a lot of inclusion for other splats, but very little for vampires. Will there be more for them? Very little for vampires. <laughs> I don't, I don't agree. <laughs> uh, no, so, to be honest, Vampire is always one of the easiest ones to include. And partly it's because of familiarity. Uh, most people's gateway game into both World of Darkness and Chronicles of Darkness is Vampire. And so that, that applies to writers too. But the uh, both Odinson and Edinburgh chapters have vampires in them and both have contagion that affects vampires, while um, Edinburgh also has a mummy focus as well, so split focus. Um, there's various vampire uh, ideas, their reactions to contagion, how they're affected by it throughout other chapters too. So vampire is definitely present throughout this book. All right. Another question from Preston. Bobo, you mentioned uh, Hurt Logger. I am an old fan. I was somewhat disappointed by the way, I don't know how to pronounce this, B-E-T-E, -E, where the first E has a weird squeaky line above it. Oh, What's percent? It says All right. bet. Just bet. Okay. Was presented in Chronicles of Darkness. Any changing breeds in Contagion Chronicle? Okay, there's a, there's a fair amount there. Um, as I mentioned, um, so with regards to the Hurt Locker book, we haven't used information from that, at least in any significant way, in Contagion Chronicle, because this is a book that works best with the core game lines. Uh, we don't want people to have to have purchased secondary source books for the Chronicles of Darkness to get the most out of this. We're already expecting them <laughs> to have purchased at least two game lines to to get play out of Contagion Chronicles. So doing more than that is something definitely for follow-up source books. And because Changing Breeds uh, would be the same there. Changing Breeds is ultimately a secondary game to Well of the Forsaken. So for content to be focused on. We haven't done it yet. It doesn't mean we won't, but it's not really the purview of the Contagion Chronicle core book. All right. Uh, shit. One second. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you lost uh, your place. I'm, I'm, I'm back. <clears throat> Robert Wagner asks, is this game the taking the price? Oh, sorry, okay, yeah, prob probably. Yeah. Is this, this game taking priority over, uh, of development over creating Werewolf Apocalypse 5th Edition? Oh, okay. Well, that's an interesting question, Robert. Yes, uh, this game, is, uh, I, you hear it here first. Breaking news. We have decided to cancel Werewolf the Apocalypse 5th No, I'm not. <laughs> Just waiting for Twitter to explode. Uh, and, and Eddie disappears. He rolls off. <laughs> to a state of nirvana um well the apocalypse fifth edition is um not in any way affected by the contagion chronicle um that doesn't mean they that werewolves can't carry diseases and wealth the apocalypse but frankly uh, i don't know what's happening with wealth the apocalypse yet it hasn't been announced that's up to paradox to talk about not onyx path and also they're in two completely different game worlds uh, Apocalypse is World of Darkness, this is Chronicles of Darkness. And while the two can become confused, uh, this uh, game is very much not affected by Apocalypse. It is a form of Apocalypse, but not a werewolf the Apocalypse. All right, Robert has another question. And he asks, after what's happened with White Wolf, which company is currently better, White Wolf or their competitor? Not really sure who. He's referring to you. <laughs> I am better. All, all, the con all the controversial questions today. Uh, which what which company is currently better, Eddie? What do you think? <laughs> oh man, really? <laughs> um, I don't know which competitor they're referring to, so I can't make an adjustment judgment on that. No, very very diplomatic. Well done there, Robert well done. Wagner. Weren't you in Sapphire and Steel? 
Uh, <laughs> was that Robert Wagner? Or was that Ian McCallan? It doesn't matter. Not Ian McCallan. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, the guy from Man from Uncle. That doesn't matter. Anyway, I'm sure this isn't the same Robert Wagner, but if it is, big fan of yours. I loved you in Austin Powers. <laughs> Right. But, um, the, if any of you have listened to the Onyx Pathcast, um, of which Eddie and I are two of the co-hosts, uh, you will know that if the show ever runs as long as this, it will have started breaking down by this point. So you when mean we get five minutes in, because that's usually our record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be honest, we've held it together for a damn long time. You should be proud of us. <laughs> that's uh, right. Uh, Cla Clara, what's the next question? We have a question from Spencer Edwards, who asks, how do Blue Book slash Minor Splats fit into the Contagion Chronicle slash The Swan slash will they be looked at in the future of Supplement? Oh, well, yeah, Blue Book, as mentioned before, Hurt Locker, I won't spend too long on this. Um, the So mortals do definitely have a part to play in Contagion Chronicle, um, but in terms of the blue books of old, including Hurt Locker, going all the way back to books like Immortals and, uh, and Book of Spirits and all sorts, um, they don't have a great presence in the Contagion Chronicle core. Doesn't mean they won't in future books, however. I can very well imagine that they will, because we want people playing this. And for all I know, there's a whole cadre of people who have been playing nothing but World of Darkness Asylum in in parts of America, and they're waiting for us to use parts of that content in another book. Well, this may be the book for you, or at least one of its follow-ups. So back it on Kickstarter. There, you've you've got my cast iron guarantee. <laughs> it's it's rusting from the inside out. We have a question from Kictus, who asks, how likely do you think we'll see a similar type of crossover thing for World of Darkness rather than Chronicles of Darkness, or at the very least, how easy would it be to adapt Contagion? I think um, I think you could definitely use the concepts of Contagion in, in World of Darkness, because it is, it is, it, it forms in so many different ways, and Contagion can be literally almost anything. And that's kind of one of the points you wanted to get through in this book, that Contagion changes from location to location and changes from splat to splat. So I think you could definitely use Contagion as a concept in your game. Okay. Well, uh -huh. I'm, happy, I'm happy with your answer, to be honest, Clara. So next question. It was a very good answer. Uh, we have... We have a question from William Orieta Bachman. Uh, you think after designing a crossover game with the new mechanics should uh, should be a, should be necessary a new edition rules to be a little bit simple, or you think the rules are okay as there is? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, so, yes, I think new edition rules uh, should be simple. Um, I mean, it's we want to provide ease of play. We want people to gain access to our games as easily as possible and have fun with them. And there's the very real temptation when you're creating a crossover game to try and adhere to the itty-bitty rules from every single game line. But what's particularly good about Chronicles of Darkness 2nd Edition is that largely every single one of the game lines has followed the same core set of rules and that innately makes them compatible with each other uh, at a basic level and contagion chronicle just kind of locks that in to my mind so i think the core chronicles of darkness rules work perfectly well as they are and um, and they work perfectly well with Contagion Chronicle. Certainly in the various sessions I ran of this, playtesting vectors and the like, I didn't run into any issues. All right. Stephen Gowdy, will the Contagion Chronicles cover hybrid supernovas, uh, i.e. liches and abominations? 
Um, again, mentioned before, uh, the antagonists such as these uh, will appear do appear throughout the book, especially among the false, but they aren't the focus of the book. Uh, but yeah, certainly a, a Tremere Lish um, may well appear in, in the Contagion Chronicle. I don't think there's one in the book from memory, but there's no reason why there wouldn't be one in, um, in one of the false factions especially. Where, where would you imagine a, a Lish from Mage the Awakening would end up, Megan? Um, let's see. That's an interesting question. I mean, the Machiavelli Gambit is definitely a place I could see the Tremere ending up. But then yeah. you have one in the cryptocracy, you never know. Well, yeah, you mentioned earlier with the pure and the cryptocracy, I think uh, that that's a very appealing faction to, to uh, for instance, the Ivory Claws and probably the Predator Kings, you know, how to uh, keep everyone else in line. We don't like our, our um, culture being tampered with. But then again, uh, depending on the Tremere in question, you might have one of them joining Nagafar's army and saying, hey, you know, Maybe this is our chance to achieve our ultimate goals and and disband all of these these false limitations on the supernal world. I mean, really, yeah, you can you can do a lot with this. I love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Clara, any other questions? We have a question from Spencer Edwards, who has a semi boring question, as he states himself: Would a slasher have reason to join the Sw Swan? Uh, Megan, what reason can you think of for a slasher to join the swarm? Ah, uh, <laughs> it depends, I guess. I mean, uh, Zero Hour could theoretically have a slasher as kind of a point and shoot, sort of a supernatural violence nuke. Um, <laughs> I mean, and the thing is, that's the thing too, is that there's definitely a place in the swarm, even for characters who, you know, antagonistic characters that may not necessarily actually themselves be on board with, you know, swearing this oath and working together and being a team player and doing these things, but the actual sworn can use those characters as weapons or dupes or manipulate them into doing their bidding or, you know, any number of things. Um, so that, that's how I'd use a slasher <laughs> if I were zero hour. Yeah. And obviously, uh, there's plenty of room for slashes in Nagalfar's army. I think they're practically opening the doors for, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, among the false. Any other questions, Clara? Or are we running to the end? Uh, we're coming to the end, but we have a couple of more. Okay. Um, we have a question from SM Acadian who says, can you make a V20 vampire with the Contagion Chronicle? Well, again, it would be jumping from World of Darkness to Chronicles of Darkness if you could, but as Clara quite eloquently put it earlier, yes, there's no reason why you couldn't put Contagion in uh, V20 and tapping into the vampire database in my head right now, I can tell you that there is, in fact, a series of novels from Vampire the Masquerade, uh, mid-90s and... Now, the name of them escapes me, but they were the Grail trilogy, where there was, in fact, a supernatural disease ravaging vampire kind, and it, in fact, devours the Prince of Berlin from the inside out. Uh, and while it isn't something that influenced the Contagion Chronicle directly, it is, uh, I guess, evidence that you can incorporate something like the Contagion in a World of Darkness game very easily indeed. Certainly pick this book up because it could provide inspiration for any horror games you're looking to run. And um, John Burke has reminded, has pointed out Robert Wagner was not in Sapphire and Steel. Important update to the viewers, Robert Wagner was not in Sapphire and Steel. Uh, he was, in fact, in Heart to Heart. It's uh, easy to confuse these um, sort of couple detective shows, but I'm glad we got there. Clara. Stephen Gaudi, again, says and asks, did you just say that Contagion could be weaponized? And yes, it can indeed be weaponized. Yes, it can. And there's lots of people that want to do it. Team Epiphany Ryan asks us if we play Fortnite. Uh, bro. <laughs> I don't know who he's uh, referring to here. Um, I do not. Play Obviously, Fortnite. Mom, yeah. 
I, I'm the only bro here. Come on. <laughs> so, so, bro, Burke, do you play Fortnite? No. Okay, well, that, that we answered that. <laughs> do you even lift, mate? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Swole is the goal, Team Epiphany, Ryan. That's right. That's why I eat brownies. Who also asks, can you say my name out loud? I just um, did. If, if your name is Team Epiphany, Ryan, then yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll do. I think we will do three more questions and then we will wrap up. I think that is the amount of questions we have left. Oh, that was clever. Ironic Iran, Cavill, sorry if I don't pronounce that correctly, has a strange question. Um, despite not being Chronicles of Darkness, but being a, a Unexpected Path game, would a, a crossover, I think, with Pogmire be possible? Eddie, uh, I guess we should ask someone. Who do you think we should ask in this panel? <laughs> um, Contagion racking the kingdom of Pugmire. So Rabies. you could, but no. So I mean, uh, there's not going to be a crossover game, and there's a couple of, of reasons for that. Um, one uh, that is the well, two big ones, I think. One is that um, Chronicles Darkness is still a licensed by uh, White Wolf, whereas Pugmire is licensed from me to Onyx Path. So. This is not an Onyx Path game. It's something that that I own and Onyx Path produces. And just like Chronicle Darkness is something White Wolf owns that Onyx Path produces. So two different companies, two different licenses, and I, and I highly doubt they want my silly dog game in their Chronicles Darkness. Um, but also I think um, it's uh, uh, something that they're both very thematically distinct. Um, I mean, you could have a very dark Pugmire game, and certainly I've run very dark Pugmire games. I, my home chronicle, I started off with a funeral, so I mean, you know, just right out of the gate, you know, really got darkness going on there. So I mean, you could have something that is akin to the Contagion Chronicle in Pugmire, but there'll that'll be like definitely a homebrew thing, and we would never, we'd never have any official kind of crossover stuff. And anyway, we don't need the re we don't need the Contagion to justify crossover. We have Pirates of Pugmire coming out. Coming up. How, how about this for a <laughs> product name drop for a uh, for a book a couple of us yeah, here? Enough about this Kickstarter. Let's talk about the next Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, want, doing good too. Yeah, if you ever want to play dogs, cats, lizards, and birds on the high seas and yep. rats, let's not forget the rats. Yep, absolutely. And and, and then we'll have uh, lizard and bird rules in uh, Pirates of so people can definitely start uh, mixing and crossovering in pirates. So definitely, that's on the radar. Okay, Clara. All right, the last two questions we have are from Dogger Days Radio. Um, and the first question says, so yeah, serious question. Any teases on how the contagion interacts with the quash, quashilim? I have oh, no idea what that, that is. That, that would be kashmalim uh, from okay. Promethean the Created. And perhaps the Inferno. Will we see how it infects you on the world? Now, I feel like there is a chapter that uh, the Geist focus chapter does tell us a little about how the contagion affects the underworld there. And there's a couple of chapters that go on about Vernian Gates and um, how the contagion is riddling them and making it, uh, making crossover a little, uh, crossing over a little more difficult and uh, perilous. In terms of how it would affect Kashmalim, I'm I can't think we've put an example in the book of a Kashmalim who is infected with contagion, but Christ, I mean, they are already pretty fucked up. Why would you want to give them a disease? <laughs> a, a walking pillar of eyeballs or hands doesn't really need much more uh, to make his life dreadful, does it? Um, what would the contagion do to a Kashmalim? Uh, I'm going to pick on Megan again. <laughs> and yeah, I know. Johnny on the spot. Um, if you were to have a Kashmalim infected with contagion, how would that change this poor sucker? <laughs> I love Megan, come up with story hooks on the spot immediately. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, as you say that, so the Kashmalim are already um, very mysterious and uh, reminiscent, as everyone knows, of uh, 
sort of the way that God Machine Angels work, although they're not the same thing. Um, I would think that if you had a cash malim that was, uh, and I know I'm pronouncing that really like Americanly, I apologize, um, infected by contagion, you would get lots of Prometheans getting lots of really fucked up azothic uh, elpis visions, um, telling them to go do some really incomprehensible things. And uh, I imagine you would get some really fucked up firestorms too. Um, my personally, if I were the storyteller, I would have a contagion infected Arch Kashmalim show up and cause a firestorm that really is not a place you want to be. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, it could even be a Kashmalim's attempt to eradicate contagion gone horribly wrong. Absolutely. And actually, uh, thinking about this too, though, um, considering the what the Azoth is, uh, I think the ship of Theseus would actually be really interested in um, studying a Kashmalim uh, infected by contagion because the thought of, you know, Prometheans are already drawn to that sworn group um, for that reason. And the idea of the essence of Azoth, of alchemical change and um, being a, an agent of contagion just really would hook them hardcore. Okay, we've got one last question, Clara. All right. Make it a and good one. From, I'm not the judge of that. It's from <laughs> Darker Days Radio. I guess does it mean crosser when second edition is easier, easier than first edition? Yes. Uh, categorically, <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, I would hesitate to say this is why crossover wasn't done in first edition, but there was definitely more of a siloed approach to the way the first edition Chronicles of Darkness or New World of Darkness, as they were then, games were developed. And, um, you know, I wasn't around at that point other than at the tail end. Eddie was. Uh, but I hope that I'm speaking accurately when I say that most of the teams that worked on the first edition cores um, excluding some developers that jumped from game to game, were rather, well, were focused on their game lines. And these days, the communication between developers and writers is far stronger. Uh, I would say with Onyx Path, we are, we are getting better at talking to each other about our game lines, making sure we all know what's going on. Megan has, in fact, very recently put together a wonderful... Uh, wonderful folder full of utilities for Chronicles of Darkness to help future authors and developers so that we can have that kind of consistency for second edition books um, from a mechanical uh, level beyond. And that means second edition is, uh, is a gift to people who enjoy crossover. Whether you want to use Contagion or not, it shouldn't be that difficult to blend your games together. It doesn't, there's not so much conflict between the metaphysical aspects of Chronicles of Darkness lines as there were World of Darkness games. And while there were in the past the occasional few new World of Darkness games, like Mummy the Curse, for instance, that was deliberately setting out to be its own game that didn't touch on the other new World of Darkness games, that's not what we're doing with Chronicles of Darkness. The games all touch each other, they are all intertwined with each other, and they will all reference how they interact. So I think it was high time for a crossover game, and hopefully Contagion Chronicle is the game people want. That's a nice way to end, isn't it? I'm, uh, I'll, in fact, I'll, re I'll reprise that, I'll go back. Ignore that. It is the game people want. <laughs> Back it on Kickstarter. See, I can I can switch this from being hopeful and nice to dictatorial and just dickish. <laughs> so I'm a man for all seasons, whatever you like. Um, no, we would really appreciate it if you backed the Kickstarter, if you at least check it out. Uh, it will be massively appreciated because we've all spent a lot of time on this book. It was a massive undertaking to put it together. And we're so pleased with the positive feedback and responses received so far. Kickstarter isn't over yet. We're about halfway there. And I have no doubt we will hit more stretch goals before the end. So please give it a look. At the very least, there's lots of manuscripts, uh, previews that are available via the updates. And 
if you are only interested in reading the manuscript, that's absolutely fine. Back at the lowest level, you will see the book in manuscript form uh, before its release. So you can make a decision on whether to back for the full product at the end. Any final words from our panelists? Yes, I would like to officially apologize for using the word Kashmalim in the singular. The singular is Kashmal. I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I should also apologize, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I have a question, actually, before we go. Yes. Uh, for you, Matthew. Oh. Um, is that an NXT TakeOver shirt you're wearing? It is an NXT TakeOver <laughs> shirt I'm wearing. Um, it's obviously from an NXT TakeOver that I attended. Um, nice. Very cool. The UK, yeah. Um, I haven't seen WrestleMania yet, but um, I have no doubt that Spoiler, WrestleMania... Spoiler, it's eight and... hours long. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is wrestling related. Yeah, I, I have to break that down to episodes. <laughs> you do. Yeah. And anything from Mr. Burke? Everything from Mr. Burke. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and anything from Clara? I'd like to apologize for mispronouncing Chris. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> You should try. Um, you should try developing Mummy the Curse. Uh, actually, there's not not so many pronunciation issues in that book. It's just um, again, Huber Stank will be making an appearance in second edition <laughs> as the new pillars, uh, Huber and Stat and Nook. <laughs> you uh, should see. There's a gigantic spreadsheet that Dave Brookshaw has of all of the major terms. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, on that ominous note, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. And thank you so much for engaging, posing us your questions. We've had a bit of fun, and uh, I'm incredibly grateful for you watching us be idiots for a little while, hopefully informative idiots. And, yeah, see you over on the Kickstarter. Drop in the comments and say whether you watch this live stream. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.